Hello, my name is Kerry Kolosko and I'll be talking about creative visualizations in Power BI. I'll be talking about what is creativity and what creativity is in data visualization, how we can think creatively, and I'll have demonstrations of tools that can enable us to build creative visualizations in Power BI. So what is creativity? Creativity is a broad term. Its usage and meaning has evolved and morphed over time. The term is used in several ways to describe a set of processes, creative thinking, creative problem solving, the personal characteristics of people, the creative personality type, and results. Creating new products on a production line that are alike is not creative. Creating new products that have no purpose is also not considered creative. Whereas creating new and different products not seen before that provide a genuine solution to a problem is considered creative. So we can think of creativity as the process of generating novel and useful ideas, or the production of relevant and effective novelty. And I'll be using that a lot throughout the presentation, the production of relevant and effective novelty. There's distinction among levels of creativity too. So we can have an inventive versus innovative, a different application of the already known versus development of new principles. Highly original ideas are important, but sometimes the greatest test of creativity is taking an existing idea and giving it a new lease of life. There's also distinction between art and creativity. What's comforting to know is that creative Power BI reports need not be artistic. So why is it important? Creativity, as we all know, leads to innovation, societal or technological progress. We know that creative solutions are noticeable and they're memorable, and they may potentially be more efficient and effective than current practices. Creativity also stems boredom from the practitioner's perspective. Creativity is creating new chart types. Here we can see a word cloud created in 2005, bullet chart created in 2006, chord diagram created in 2007, rain cloud plot in 2018. Creativity is taking the old and rearranging them into new ways. Here with the rain cloud plot, we've got the um, old charts such as half a violin plot, the density plot, alongside a box plot and a jittered scatter plot. So we've got old themes rearranged in new ways. Here we're taking the old and rearranging them into original ways. Taking the old and combining them in the original ways. And creativity is daring to be different. If the novelty is not effective, or a data viz is not intelligible, then it is art. But should we always strive to be creative with data viz? It's not always necessary to be creative. In our current landscape where everything is bright, colourful, animated, and everything's competing for our attention, sometimes simple minimalism is just what the doctor ordered. If we're creating financial reports where accuracy is key for decision making and justification, then following best practice, tried and tested methods, going with visuals that are more familiar, is probably a good idea. But if exploring data, understanding relationships and making inferences, creating explanatory reports with engaging informational type visualizations, where getting the gist of something is okay, then it's safer to be experimental. In order to inspire creativity, we first need to understand what it is that inhibits it. One of these things can be design fixation. Design fixation occurs when designers adhere steadfastly to a set of ideas that limit creative outcomes. So for example, giving students a design problem and then showing them an existing solution can limit their creative outputs. A study into experiences and perspectives of practitioners uncovered some key contributors to design fixation. 
The first one being and quite a big one for me, um, I find is chart recommendations. So the existence of chart recommendations from software uh, can promote adherence to a design idea and limit your creative thinking. Um, other things that also contribute being too focused on details and not the big picture can result in fixation. Um, the amount of effort required for creativity and design um, can be off-putting and quite discouraging. Um, the role of prior experiences and existing practices or habits. So, uh, for example, having solved some problems previously or people getting stuck in rigid best practices and um, seeing, seeing it as having to do things in a certain way. Um, another thing as well is precedent, so whereby people are influenced by prior visualisation designs. And um, lastly, fairly importantly as well, is client stakeholder influence. So clients changing their minds, sharing their own ideas about the design and um, having to adhere to things like brand guidelines. On the flip side, there are a number of ways to promote creativity. Some of these being incubation, putting this problem aside for a while, experimenting, brainstorming, what if postulations, garnering inspiration from existing visualizations, art, nature and environment, seeking feedback, initiating discussions and changing perspective. So deliberately thinking in a different way. I will be focusing on inspiration for this presentation. So what do we need to be creative? Here I've highlighted four things that have come out of studies into creativity, inherent ability, intrinsic motivation, and the two that I'm really going to be focusing on for the rest of the presentation, knowledge and boldness. So inherent ability describes our baseline levels of creativity, which are largely set by the time we reach adulthood. They come down to personality traits, such as intellectual curiosity, openness to experience and unconventionality. Our creative abilities can still be nurtured with training over periods of time. Intrinsic motivation is the desire to engage in creative activities for the sake of the activity itself and not in the hope of obtaining external rewards. Being creative for creativity's sake. Extrinsic motivation, which is the opposite of intrinsic motivation, which is the seeking of external rewards, can inhibit creativity as people shape their behaviours and thinking for rewards such as praise, recognition and promotional opportunities. If they are designing with promotional opportunities in mind, that will limit their thoughts and outputs. Other creative motives include playful motives and expressive motives. Creating games fun, alternate visuals and Power BI is a great way to flex those creative muscles and skills. No, knowledge. So without expertise or task relevant skills, we can't produce anything creative. Expertise is not enough alone. It's not enough to master the elements. We also have to rearrange them into original ways. Learn the basics before we can break the rules. And boldness. So creativity requires doing things differently from the way they're usually done, defying the norms. Um, sometimes we call that contrarianism. Um, it's also the readiness to expose oneself to being wrong and open to critique is really important to creativity. So the key to creativity is being brave, trying new things and learning from mistakes. So what do I need to know to be creative? A um, little quote here, as you mentioned before, so it's good to learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Um, to be creative, we need to have that knowledge. So we need to understand our data um, and our data types. So the differences between quantitative and qualitative data. We need to understand um, the context. So starting a visualization without clarifying why it matters to the audience um, before we start is a recipe for failure. Um, it helps to have a memory of the building blocks of data visuals too, so data binding and data encoding methods and an understanding of the um, efficacy of each. Um, also an understanding of the foundations of visual perception, you know, such as just up principles, pre-attentive and attentive attributes and understanding our tool, right? So we've got to master our tool and know how to work it, 
um, with as much depth as necessary. Um, don't have to know it inside and out, but enough. So what makes up a chart? One way to conceptualize data visualization is to think about data visuals as comprising data types, visual attributes, and marks. In this way of thinking, marks are components of shapes whose attributes such as size, position, color, can be used to visually encode data. Understanding data types is important. How we visualize data needs to fall in line with our conceptualizations of continuous or categorical data, otherwise it won't be effective. But also our visualizations can't be arithmetically false. Placing averages over ordinal or nominal data may not make sense. In understanding marks, we can think of point line and area as the component parts of shapes. And these are what we want to graph in our visualizations. Many tools will have the basic shapes, um, triangle, circulars and squares, polygons and arcs, text and images as foundational elements too, um, that can have their height, width and scale modified. Data binding or data encoding is the mapping between a mark's attributes, position, size, color, and texture, all of that, um, and data. And this data can be constant or variable. Our visual encodings can then be layered, separated, joined to create different views and composition and become interactive to add additional contextual information. Our visuals can be themed to be more aesthetically pleasing or more easily read. Now that we have our building blocks, how do we build a visual? So rather than looking at our data and our data types and then choosing from a predetermined chart library, we could think about potentially um, ways to build a visual up from its component parts, which is most suited to our data. And I'll talk a little bit later as well as also drawing from inspiration and, and, and other things to help build that. Up, but here I'm just going to go through a simple process. It won't produce the most amazing chart at the end or necessarily one that makes total sense, but um, it's the, the process of building a chart up from component parts. Um, and here we can start with a single point, right? So um, represented by an open or unfilled circle. And then we're going to um, encode the position horizontally with data. In this case, um, we're using a dates field to record horizontally. And then using another dimension, I'm going to encode again the marks by position uh, using a values field. Um, and there's some tools provide ability to encode um, position with angle and Z values or geoencoding as well. I have another dimension that I want to add, and I will pick color as the attribute that I will uh, change with data. And where I've used point marks um, to represent raw values and encoded these um, attributes, position and color with different dimensions, I, I might now want to be looking at, rather than just the raw values, you know, the averages of these um, values. And to do that, I would probably want a different mark. And um, in this case, I might use a line mark to represent those averages over time. And I can layer the two on top of each other. And with that, the chart was getting very busy. So I might then want to think about um, trellising or you know, using small multiples to break out those subcategories of data, in which case I've chosen to do that via a um, dimension that has left the color redundant um, because I've now encoded with that dimension twice. 
Um, but in this case, you know, I don't mind. I, I quite like to keep that colour in to, to make it stand out a little bit more visually. And so I have raw values and averages. I might also want to do some more statistical transforms and look at things like interquartile ranges or probability density. I'll represent those visually and perhaps um, join them onto subplots so, or easy contrast. I won't do much in the way of interactivity, except perhaps add additional context with tooltips. And then I might fiddle around with the aesthetics, font, colour, grid lines to achieve a certain outcome, and whether that be affiliation with branding, better visual appeal, less clutter, consistency, or whatever else that the end goal might be. We might have our building blocks, but to build effective novelty, um, they need to be wisely encoded. And an understanding of how accurately we can interpret visual variables um, aids this. Um, so in this little graph to the left, we can see that um, you know, we can perceive differences in position um, better than we can um, differences in angle or color, for example. Other things to think about are whether some encodings are better for different data types. Um, so we know that color value is very poor for nominal data, but it's great for ordinal data, for example. We might also want to think about whether there are individual differences in perception to be aware of. The most notable um, that comes to mind um, for everybody is people with color vision deficiencies, but there are other things to be conscious of. Similarly, are there visual distortions or illusions to be cautious of? So are we chopping um, the length of bars off um, along the y-axis, for example, and um, misleading our consumers into seeing bigger differences than there are? You know, and are, are we creating this um, skintillating grid effect to, to the left here um, that can be very distracting for end users? And we also might want to think about the colour choices we use, you know, how do they impact our emotional and visceral responses? Um, and then how does that then impact decision making based on the visuals we produce? And did you hit the brief? Have you communicated everything that needed to be communicated? Too much or too little? Once we understand our building blocks and we have an understanding of differences in perception, we can start to think um, a bit more visually. And one of the ways that we can be creative in data visualization is to gather inspiration from our natural world or from the data itself. Um, one of the easiest um, ways to, to think creatively or be creative um, is to sort of use a process that I I like to call visual onomatopoeia, but um, that's a lack of having a, a better word for it. Um, and here's an example of that, for example. So um, we can see that there's a uh, report on um, cherry blossom seasons in uh, Japan, and they've used um, inspiration of cherry blossoms um, to create their chart. And we can see here that we have flower shapes as point marks. Um, and these have the visual variables of colour and opacity, but these aren't encoded with data that they're constant. Um, they're encoded by position though, they have um, placement of these points are uh, encoded horizontally by year and vertically by month and day. There's also a line mark with constant colour and thickness and an area which is variable. Um, I presume that there's no interactivity and the theme has no set of called grid lines and a deliberate colour palette with very large font on the dates for a reason that remains unknown to me. So I'm about to start looking at the tooling options um, for creative visuals in Power BI. And just to reiterate what we sort of talked about so far, um, you know, we, we know what the building blocks are to build up a visual. We know that to be creative, we can take the old to rearrange them into new ways or combine them in original ways. Um, we need to be daring, bold and different. Um, we can gather inspiration from the data itself or the environment. 
and then we just look at what appropriate tools we have available to us. So what are our options for creative visualizations with Power BI? We can use the existing um, chart recommendations uh, if we get really, really clever. But in terms of um, having that flexibility for those creative outputs, um, there are some custom visuals in AppSource that do really well. So Synoptic Panel, PureViz, Charticulated, Deneb, HTML Content are the ones that I'm going to focus on at the moment. There are a few others um, available to us. Uh, some might think of D3, R, Python, Visio, um, Plotly, and there's some SVG animators on the market now. But, um, but these are the ones that I'm going to focus on. Fuelviz is a custom visual where we can import an SVG image to do simple transforms on SVG elements, provided that they're tagged appropriately as recognisable elements. And um, if we know SVG and HTML well, we can recognise these shape elements as circles, ellipses, lines, paths, polygons, rectangles. Transforms can include colour, visibility, height, width, scale, positioning, and area percentage fill. So we can have a custom shape that we can um, fill 60% top to bottom or left to right, 80% top to bottom, left or right. I'll be demoing a visual that I created where I took inspiration from the data itself, the data set about lies, and um, created a visual accordingly. So here I have a data set from a news organisation that fact checks presidents and presidential candidate statements. And they've compiled, compiled a list of fact checked false statements, which are basically lies. And what I want to visualise from this, um, as it's only one person, I don't have a comparison or a baseline, is to just visualise the magnitude and enormity of the false statements over time. Um, there's a number of ways to do this. A cumulative line graph would work well, but as these are lies, I thought I might amuse myself. Um, if we think back to the beginning of the presentation, creativity can stem boredom. Um, and having fun is a great motivator to practice creativity and get those skills going. Um, and I'm going to amuse myself with the likeness of a president whose nose grows with each lie told over time. Um, I will change the likeness of the president because I don't want to be attacked with pitchforks or stir up any controversy. That's not my aim. Um, so here goes. So in Illustrator, I've taken an image, done an image trace, and very simply created a second element here, which is, now you can do this in anything, it doesn't have to be Illustrator, a simple rectangle with rounded edges, which I have exported as SVG. And when you look at SVG. You can see there's one great big path and then that little element there, that rectangle with the width and the height of that many pixels and then it's got little rounded edges on the side there. And it's called out as a rectangle shape and that's what we're going to be manipulating in PureViz. So now we can go into our PureViz visual. I've already imported the um, SVG in, so I've skipped a few uh, steps, and I've placed in um, two, one measure, which is your lies measure, which counts the number of lies told over time, um, and a index. And if we go in and we edit, we can see we've got different layers. So remember that big path shape that we saw? Um, that represented by this shape and then that little rectangle element. So this is what we're interested in looking at. And here we can do some modifications. So we could pick a custom color if we wanted to, but that's what I'm, not, what I'm interested in today. I just want to stick to the default color. It's got border color, border width, um, and visibility. So we might want to put some conditions on to show or hide um, the element. 
Um, but right now I want to go into properties. What I want to do here is um, I've adjusted the height just a little bit um, just to make it more aligned with the nose. But I want a con I want conditional format, right? So I want a um, function here to grow the um, length of the nose for each line told. And in here I've done very, very simple. I've just chosen the lies measure, hit apply, and it's done. And so what you can see now is that um, here's the play axis visual with the date. And as we play through the dates, it will count the number of lies and the nose will grow by the number of lies over time. And the nose grows really quite quickly and um, eventually over the page. And the fact that it goes over the page is um, quite an impactful thing to watch. Traticulator is a no-code designer. It's a flexible drag and drop tool. So you can drag your data onto your marks and then your marks onto your canvas to create some bespoke charts. Whilst you can create some interesting Cartesian plots, Traticulator is probably most useful for polar, radial and custom plots. Um, it contains four basic mark types which you can um, manipulate with data and then these visuals, um, once completed and exported, have the ability for tooltips, drill throughs and interactivity with other Power BI visuals. So another demo I will be showing uh, with a Traticulator visual is creating a custom visual um, that reminds me of universes and solar systems. So I have a data set about Marvel and DC movies. Thinking about what it is I want to explore, um, looking through what I've got here, I might want to compare the average meta score for company and see which one outperforms. But I also want to see the grain. So I want to see the number of movies by company, outliers and maybe some patterns. But Primarily the information, the main thing I want to see is the average meta score by company and the rest is secondary information. Interesting, but not quite as important. And so when I think about Marvel versus DC, I think about the universes. I think about the colors of red and yellow from the various characters and logos. So that's going to be my inspiration for the next visual. So I can start with a shape and pop it on a glyph canvas. I can then use the release here, drag that down onto the x-axis like so. Then maybe I would like to change the colour of these symbols, in which case I can come down to the fill, um, decide what I want to change the colours to, which will be the average meta score. Choose some colours that remind me a little bit of the universe colours. Maybe add a legend to that too. And because I'm thinking about um, universes, I might decide that I want a polar scaffold. I might want to think about um, these movies and their average Metascore ratings. You might want to think about them orbiting a large object. And so that could be the total average, for example, of uh, Metascore ratings. So perhaps I might want to put another circle in the middle, increase its size. Maybe I want to also change the The film. And pop in a little text mark. And this could be the average meta score.
And there's a lot more I can do with this and play around with. I can potentially come in and change something like that, group them differently. And I'll stick with what I've got. I can also play with the axes and change them, vert them around, maybe add some uh, label text, maybe I want the movie names coming out the side, but this will do for now. And then I'll be able to save and then export the visual and import into a Power BI desktop file, like so. And here are some various different versions of um, Charticulator visuals trying to replicate that sort of Marvel versus DC universe style. So I've taken inspiration from the universes to create a custom visualization. So here I'm quite happy that I've hit my brief. Primarily I wanted to compare the total credit scores average between two companies, so Marvel versus DC. And um, a bar chart might be better for that because we can interpret differences in length better than differences in colour. But because I have the data labels and I wanted to be able to see the secondary information, which is the individual movies around the outside, um, the compromise works out. So Deneb is a custom visual that utilises the Vega and Vega like declarative language, um, different from Charticulator, and it's more typey typey than it is clicky clicky draggy droppy. Um, and there's more control over the encoding of data to marks and their layouts. Uh, Deneb has other options for several different mark types, encodings and um, data transforms. So there's um, a statistical API that can be utilized. Um, layering marks and joining graphs is a key benefit. So with Deneb comes great flexibility enabling almost limitless creative potential. So what Deneb enables is more encoding options, gradients, patterns, textures, and custom shapes. And we can build these to create a variety of visualizations. So I have some survey data. I have the date in which the survey was undertaken, the opinions, legal under any circumstances, legal only under certain circumstances, illegal in all circumstances, and then the percentage of respondents. So what I really want to see is how the opinions on abortion have changed between the first survey in 1977 and the present. So I see time as linear, sometimes as cyclic, but in this point I view it as linear. They have four categories, they're always illegal, always legal, sometimes okay, no opinion, and these are percentages. I don't want to see what the results were in 1977 and in 2019. I want to see the degree of change up or down. So that changes my thinking, so I don't need to do bars, right? So I want to see the degree of change um, between the two time periods up or down. I might want to think about having one of those categories such as no opinion, maybe at 20%, and then in 2019 it might be 22%, and then I want to look at the degree of change, so I'll draw a straight line between the two, and that will give me some kind of um, feeling for that. I might have a category that's always illegal, and then in 2019 it's lower, between the two things you can see how it's changed over time. So what I'm doing is I'm drawing a slight graph. 
So what I've done now is I've created that initial slope chart. I have my line, which I've added an interpolation bundle with tension of zero. So what that means is I've made it a straight line between the two points in time. And you have your various encodings. So up here, I've encoded the year along the x-axis, the percentage along the y-axis, and then I've coded the responses in color. Consists of a layer, so this is the line. In a, it's layered. And what I've also layered is the text and point, or in this case, circles on top of the lines. So what I'm going to do now is I've looked at that. I quite like that. I like the fact that I can see that um, over time, people are supportive of abortion and that um, they believe you know, it should be legal in all, under any circumstances. People that don't support abortion stayed steady between the two points in time. But I'm curious to see how that's changed over time as well. Has it steadily decreased? Or has there been massive fluctuations perhaps in response to events over time? So what I've decided to do is add another mark and I want to layer that in and I want to lay it underneath the straight line. And I want to, it's my secondary information. I don't want to draw attention to this because I'm really interested in this as secondary information. So I've made the opacity really light. And I've put an interpolation on that as well. So rather than um, being a straight line, I'm going to have a slight curve to it. And now you can see the trends over time. So this works for me. I can see how it's changed. Opinions have changed over time. It hasn't been steadily downwards. There's been an interesting point in period where the opinions have changed quite dramatically. And I get what I want from this visual. So here I've combined two different um, chart types, a typical line series chart type and a slope chart to create something new and different. Um, to me, for me, it's quite effective, but there is a um, potential that somebody else could misinterpret the slope here being a line of best fit instead of the slope between the last and first points. But at this point in time, that's, it's not important. So there's a lot of creative potential with Zenit. We can create our own custom shapes and draw inspiration from the natural world around us or in this case, literature. HTML content is a, another custom visual that enables creative outputs, utilizes CSS and HTML, and with it, um, it enables us in our Power BI reports to do things such as rich text formatting, embedding, so embedding of videos or other um, data visuals, potentially from Data Wrapper or Google Charts, um, and also the use of SVG. Why would I use SVG? Um, in, with the HTML content over Deneb or PureViz, um, and I would be doing that when I'm thinking specifically about targeting points on polygon paths or um, utilising SMIL and CSS animations. So I would call this novel. I wouldn't say it was effective novelty, um, but still, here we've got some HTML, and one, two, three blades um, with polygon points and individual points have been targeted here to change with data. So we can see that over time the width of the blades, these particular points will 
change of shape. Again, not very effective, but a fun exercise. Then again, with some HTML tags, we can create this one parameter here. We can use SVG and smell animations to create some interesting effects. And SVG filters as well. 